Hi, I don't really have an intro for this video. I just wanted to talk about some books I've read recently that I just haven't talked about yet. So let's get into it. I have four books, so not a lot. And I don't have any notes, so we'll see how good my memory is. So I'm going to talk about them from the lowest rating to the highest rating. First we have Sweet Bean Paste by Durian Sukagawa. I read this like two days ago <laughs> at work. I listened to it on audiobook. Don't tell my boss. It was a Friday, it was... I didn't have much to do, so I listened to the audiobook. And to me this is a free star. It was fine. It felt like a Lifetime movie, except set in Japan, and also I've never watched a Lifetime movie, but <laughs> I think the metaphor stands. It was just like sentimental, a bit cheesy, kind of like a feel-good kind of movie. There is a movie actually uh, based on this book. And yeah, the thing is, so basically this book is about, what was his name? Sentaro, who has this like stall, how do you, how do you say that? A tiny confectionery shop and he's selling doriaki and he's uh, like an ex-con, like he, he went to jail for some time. And there's this older woman who approaches him one day and says, I want to help you out, I want to work there. You know, a friendship blossoms. To me, the most interesting part, uh, how do I talk about this without spoiling the plot? It's not really a plot twist, but there is a character, there's something revealed about them, and that kind of plot point was very interesting to me, kind of from a historical standpoint. <laughs> I really can't tell you much, but I actually wished that this book was written from the perspective of that character. I feel like it would be much more interesting that way. But yeah, like I didn't have a bad time, it was just fine. So, three stars. Okay, then we have Sea of Tranquility by Emily St. John Mandel. I've read all of Emily St. John Mandel's books um, and nothing really compares, uh, in my opinion, to Station Eleven. I ended up giving this 3.5 stars. So, first things first, I am a bit confused how this book isn't a sequel to The Glass Hotel. Like, why isn't it marketed as that, if that makes sense? Uh, because, I mean, I've seen people who haven't read The Glass Hotel and read this and really enjoyed it, but I feel like you would get much more from this book if you read The Glass Hotel. Like, to me, personally, I give The Glass Hotel three stars and the kind of revelations in this book when it comes to certain characters that like appeared both in this book and uh, The Glass Hotel. Like, The Glass Hotel, because of this book, makes so much more sense to me now and it like feels like The Glass Hotel was a setup for this book when it comes to one plot point of this book, but... So, okay, what is it about? Uh, there are... what do you call it? They're not timelines. Are they timelines? Okay, so we have different periods of time where we get like little vignettes from different characters of that time. That sentence makes no sense. Basically, okay, how do I talk about this? This is a science fiction book and in this book we have a chapter from 1912, 2020, 2203 and 2409. Yes. And you know, in each of those timelines we have, you know, a certain characters that we're following. I surprisingly wanted this to be much longer. The setup for this book is very interesting and just like in Sweet Bean Paste, I can't really talk about, for example, which timeline and character I like the most because I would spoil it for you. But without saying too much, this book reminded me a little bit of um, The Umbrella Academy. I actually wish, similarly to Sweet Bean Paste, that we actually read this book from the perspective of the character from 2203 timeline, so the one that's like most in the future. I was surprised because I thought I wouldn't enjoy a timeline that's set so far in the future because I thought it would be like too confusing, but it isn't. I do feel like Emily St. John Mandel really excels in like science fiction dystopian novels. So, basically just the timelines that were more in the future, uh, I found those a lot more interesting and I wish we got more of that. And those parts had so many interesting... we could have explored, but we just didn't, so... Yeah, the, it just felt like little vignettes uh, and I wish we really like sunk our teeth into 
this world a little bit more. But I also didn't hate it, so 3.5 stars. Then we have Excellent Woman by Barbara Pym. This is a book I already read with Lucy from the channel Lucy Ruthenford. I will link her channel in the description. And I really had a great time reading it with Lucy. Okay, so this book is about this 30-something-year-old um, woman who is single. She calls herself a spinster. <laughs> and we start this book when new neighbors move into her like apartment complex. It's very like modern woman who is an anthropologist and her husband who, who just like came back from war. She spends her days uh, going to the church every single day and like helping out there, like sorting out through like clothes that could be like sold for a very cheap price to women in need. And yeah, I I like this. I, I gave it... Um, at first I thought this was more of a like 3.5 star, but somehow on Goodreads... I normally on Goodreads, if I have a 3.5 star, I round them down, so I give it uh, 3 stars. But with this book, this 3.5 star felt closer to a 4 star, so I ended up giving it 4 stars on Goodreads. And the more I think about it, the more I feel like this is just a 4 star. I really enjoyed it. <sighs> this in reviews is like described as like biting satire, like full of irony, and like sure it is there, but it just... I don't know, it wasn't as hilarious and like clever as I thought it would be. It has a pretty simple writing style, but I also understand when the comparisons to like Jane Austen come from, I, I do. I have to say the ending caught me by surprise and I can't really... you know, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but it felt for a, like a book that is described as a comedy of manners. It felt very like quietly tragic, to be quite honest. The thing that kept me from like absolutely loving it was the portrayal of feminism. I heard this is a pretty feminist book and like obviously it was, was written in the 50s so like my view on, on what is feminist will be different compared to like that period of time, but I just felt like the feminist themes never really like went anywhere. Uh, like there were some like little like ironic remarks and like jabs at the men that Mildred was surrounded by, but it felt like the author never like fully leaned into the like feminist ideas. And when I finished this book, I stumbled upon this essay. I will link it in the description, but there was this passage that I will like read out to you. Pym wasn't a feminist, though she wasn't against feminism. Her novels, however astutely they characterize women's subservience, are not about justice or rebellion. Pym liked housework and uh, disparaged aggressive sexuality in women. When I read that, it suddenly like clicked in my brain why I can love this book. Because while she was like complaining about this like position of woman in society, it, in the end it felt like the author was like, well, it do be like that. <laughs> it's like, nothing we can do though. <laughs> like, but there is though. <laughs> so I felt like the ending was quite realistic, but I, I kind of felt like we were building up to something else. But yeah, the author never like went there. But I had such a great time uh, reading this book with Lucy. She had so many like interesting points about this book and like how, especially about like feminism and about like social progression and how it isn't always like a linear thing. Uh, yeah, we had this discussion about the 50s and like how because of the war the woman like took over the jobs that men had and after the war finished it felt like there was this almost like pushback. I don't know, I didn't realize there was uh, like this conservative wave in the 50s and like I don't know it made sense to me because I felt like some of the feminist ideas in the earlier decades felt more progressive than what we read in this book. I don't know maybe none of uh, what I'm saying makes sense but this is how I felt. <laughs> so yeah ended up giving it four stars, still enjoyed it. And lastly, we have a nonfiction, A Disability Visibility, edited by Alice Wong. This is a book that I have read since November, so it took me five months to finish it. I think what I learned about myself is that I don't do well with, like, anthologies. Is that how you say that? So basically this is a collection of 37 essays from different authors, people with disabilities. So since we have so many different writers in this collection, I just never knew what I would get from the next essay, and I just kept putting this book down. But I still I enjoyed it. I gave four stars. Uh, I feel like I learned a lot. I think this is a really good collection um, because it like encompasses so many different like experiences. 
and like perspectives. This collection has people from different like socio-economical backgrounds uh, of different like religions, different races, ethnical like backgrounds. It talks about obviously different types of disability, which also includes not only like intellectual disabilities, but like mental disabilities, like mental health. You know, we have like people with bipolar disorder, stuff like that. Like obviously we have so many different essays, so there are going to be essays that I liked more and essays that I, I liked a bit less. But when it comes to this collection, I have one critique um, and that is I wish the essays were kind of not categorized. What is the word that I'm looking for? You know, lumped together into different sections. Like, okay, there are four parts, basically. The first part is being, second part is becoming, the part three is doing, and part four is connecting. And I felt like this, like, distinction felt a bit pointless. I wish, I wish those essays were grouped together in a different way. I don't know what kind of way, but it just didn't... this didn't really make sense to me. Okay, so some of my favorite essays would be Unspeakable Conversations by Harriet McBride Johnson. Um, this one talked about this disabled woman kind of relationship, as in like she would talk uh, for emails to this very famous writer called Peter Singer, I think. And she like debated him uh, in real life too. And basically Peter Singer was, I think, an Australian philosopher and he was like an animal rights activist. Uh, he wrote this very famous book called Animal Liberation. And basically he also advocated for, what is it called? Infanticide, I think infanticide so like basically killing like newborns or like very young children if they have any disabilities what you are fighting for animal rights but you're like uh, but humans with disabilities mm, let's kill them like basically he was saying that like parents who have children with disabilities like young children new births they can you know kill them it... <laughs> i don't get it so yeah that's fucking terrifying. Another essay I really liked, The Isolation of Being Deaf in Prison by Jeremy Woody, a told to Kristen Thompson. This is a great example of like an essay that's not written, that doesn't have any like amazing writing style or anything, but is just so like eye-opening and just so amazing without like being, you know, extremely well written. So th yeah, this one obviously is about being deaf in prison. And the thing that like outraged me the most is how the people in the prison would group together people with different disabilities. Like, basically he had a roommate who was blind, which is ridiculous because, like, he's deaf, his roommate is blind. How the fuck are they supposed to communicate? <sighs> or, like, he couldn't attend classes because he was deaf and teachers at those classes basically like, kicked him out because there were no, like, accommodations. <sighs> yeah, just so frustrating. Another good one was... Falling slash burning, Hannah Gatsby, Nanette, and being a bipolar creator. I really have to watch um, Hannah Gatsby um, comedy special, Nanette. And last one would be Time's Up For Me Too by Caroline Gehring. Yeah, I do remember she talked about a few movies, uh, especially like Shape of Water and the kind of representation of a disability in those kind of movies. So, for start, I would recommend this collection. Um, I just think personally, I guess I prefer memoirs or collections of essays written by like a singular author. Otherwise I find it kind of hard to get through those books. So that's everything. I am currently reading a few books but I can't really talk about them because they are for a specific video. So I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you next one. Bye!